Before the year 2000 in the world of cyberpunk, America was in a rough spot. With the end of the Cold War, many European nations had banded together under the banner of the European Economic Council, or EEC, relying more and more on each other rather than the US for military and social aid, thus heavily de-emphasizing American protection to her allies. As early sourcebooks tell us, this would result in the creation of the Gang of Four, a political cabal composed of the CIA, NSA, FBI, and DEA who would take control of American affairs out of the hands of the executive branch and begin attempting to quietly undermine the EEC through manipulation of their stocks and the value of their new currency, the Euro dollar. However, in the year 1994, this plot would be blown wide open as the Gang of Four's meddling was discovered by the rest of the world, which would result in nearly every country on Earth imposing crippling embargoes on the US, and with no means of conducting trade, and with more people living below the poverty line than ever before, the event now known today as the Collapse was all but inevitable. The collapse of the United States would bring the cyberpunk of the past much closer to our image of the series today than perhaps any other event in the game's history. The nation would be put into a state of martial law, and as cities and local governments collapsed, millions of people would take to the roads as parts of nomad tribes. But in the midst of all this chaos, there were still some who managed to avoid the crippling effects of the nation's earth-shattering fall. Many, of course, were corporate executives who couldn't really care less about what was going on outside, but there was one man who, in spite of everything, made a good faith attempt to use his money and influence for good in the midst of such trying times. In the process, creating that which is inarguably the single most iconic location in all of cyberpunk. That man's name was Richard Knight, and today we'll be exploring his story and his legacy all the way from the beginning to their potential machinations in the near future. This is the full lore of Richard Knight, Knight Corporation, and of course, Night City. So, just who was this guy, anyway? Well, to put it simply, Richard Alix Knight was nobody, if not a visionary. Born in the year 1954 in Pasadena, California, Richard was the son of two Caltech researcher parents, both of whom specialized in material science. He had a total of four siblings, of which Richard himself was the second oldest, and even in his early years, Knight proved competent in many of his educational endeavors, fostering a special interest in engineering. It was in pursuit of this interest, in fact, that Knight would attend college, hoping to attain an engineering degree, but as the story goes, he would more or less fall out of love with the field, following an unsavory experience wherein Knight's at-the-time roommate, Romney Zukarian, with whom he had started a joint venture, manipulated him out of his share of the business. From this point forward, Knight made the switch to majoring in financial investment, and with the knowledge he attained, he was able to essentially take back ownership of the group for himself, cutting Zukarian out of the deal in the process. Now possessing knowledge in both both engineering and finance, Knight would try the whole business thing over again, and partner with two other entrepreneurial spirits to found Halsey, Ferris, and Knight, which was an independent construction and development firm that used, quote, advanced construction techniques to build massive mega projects, such as office complexes, airports, and even small cities. It seems at the time there was more than enough of this type of work to go around, and so this venture would actually go on to make its founders, including Knight, pretty well wealthy men in their time on the market. However, as the late 80s and early 90s approached, it was becoming more apparent to everyone that the social and economic climate in America was worsening fast, and despite their wealth, Knight and his partners would have felt it too. A turbulent economy meant fewer and fewer large-scale construction projects were planned, and as such, their business would have begun to dry up, even if only slightly at the time. The thing that seemed to be most worrisome to Knight, however, was not the monetary aspect at all, but rather that he saw rates of violence increasing in the nation by the day, and this sentiment in particular seems to have struck a chord with him. Knight really did seem to foresee many of the negative social effects of America's collapse before a lot of other people at the time, and rightfully, he was worried for the very notion of safety and order within a post-collapse society. And so, as a result, Knight began to dream of a solution that he may be able to bring into existence. The Cyberpunk Red Core book explains 
Jones, quote, Concerned by the violence and disruption of the impending collapse, Knight decided that he was uniquely suited to deal with the problem. Starting a side company, Knight Industries, to protect his partners, Knight began to plan a new city, an environment that would be controlled and ultimately safe from the ravages tearing the world apart. His new city would be completely planned, self-sufficient, and be capable of holding off even the most determined marauders. It would boast planned neighborhoods dedicated to preserving the feel of different types of nationality and cultures, as well as a super-modern corporate center that would stand as a shining beacon of enlightened capitalism. It was ambitious, far-reaching, and visionary in its approach. Now, the idea of establishing a city is already a daunting enough task. Even though Knight's background had prepared him well for just that type of work, this would easily be the most massive undertaking of the man's entire life. But what's more is this idea of a city effectively devoid of crime and corruption. Time and time again, we'll see this philosophy of social and governmental fastidiousness echoed in the depictions of Knight's actions throughout cyberpunk source material. An idealistic, some may say overly optimistic philosophy, even in light of the negative circumstances all around him. The reason I highlight this is because understanding Knight's mindset here is also central to understanding a lot of his decision making, especially in a series such as Cyberpunk, where characters that think this way are exceedingly rare. Given the evidence we have today, pretty much all signs point to Knight not really having any sort of ulterior motive or larger scheme concerning the development of a city. He really did just want to help people with very few, if any, strings attached. And after we see how everything plays out, I'll be revisiting this notion at the end of the video, because like a lot of other character arcs in Cyberpunk, I think that there is sort of a greater message at play here. So I guess just keep all that in mind for now. But regardless, let's continue. What we know now is that no matter how lofty or unachievable a city plan may seem to us, once Knight had his mind set on the idea, it wasn't going to be swayed. And so the first step to bringing his dream to reality was, of course, to acquire funding. In 1992, it's said that Knight had already courted a number of foreign and domestic investors, including Petrochem, Euro Business Machines, and Arasaka. Lo and behold, the promise of a capitalist utopia was actually pretty appealing to megacorporations, many of whom were seeking to establish a foothold in America anyway, so this was certainly a win-win scenario in that regard. Together with his own company, Knight International, as well as acclaimed investment and financial counseling firm Merrill, Asukaga, and Finch, these corporations created the initial agreement under which they would collaborate on the city project, known today as the Coronado Agreement, named for the area Area where it was eventually decided that the city would be put. The challenge of locating a sufficient area of land, however, proved a bit tougher to address than the funding problems had. First was, of course, the matter of space. Constructing an entire city meant that Knight and his partners were going to need an exceptionally vast open area, which, ideally, nobody would have already been living in. At the same time, though, the location would need to be accessible from both land and sea by way of highways and potential ports. This would not only make the acquisition of the materials needed to actually construct the city significantly easier, but it would also position it for convenient trade in the future. So pretty much anywhere that wasn't on the American East or West Coast was already considered more or less off-limits. In order to find the perfect spot, Knight sent scouts to either end of the nation, in a hunt that likely spanned several months if not longer, but ultimately it wasn't actually one of the scouting parties that would present Knight with the ideal location at all. Instead, it was a story in the San Francisco Chronicle detailing an event known as the Morro Bay Massacre. You see, in the 80s and 90s, the areas around Morro Bay, California had long been tormented by activity from local gangs and even the infamous Hells Angels. But around the time of the stock market crash of 1994, and subsequently the collapse, what were previously rather routine confrontations between gangs and law enforcement would escalate, until culminating in a five-day-long standoff between the local police of neighboring San Luis and a variety of chromed up bikers and gang members. Unfortunately, this conflict would eventually jump the boundaries of San Luis entirely, and soon the fighting would encompass the greater Morro Bay area as well. 
In the end, more than 10,000 people would perish, and with Morro Bay abandoned, Knight would pick up much of the property at a heavily reduced rate. In the end, the combined efforts of himself and Petrochem led the requisite area to be secured in a series of deals costing well over $132 million. The area's name would then be changed to Del Coronado Bay, with the planned metropolis, officially dubbed Coronado City, from this point forward. From here, one of Knight's other investors, the Arasaka Corporation, would work to clear out the area of gang activity and secure the property for construction. Their efforts were funded by Merrill, Asukaga, and Finch, as well as a number of other investors of more dubious standing. Indeed, even while Knight's city was first breaking ground, corruption already had begun to sink its teeth into his utopian vision. These same forces would come back to haunt Knight later in time, but for now, he would have been much more concerned with the dilemma of what to do about the harbor. As Knight's plans grew, it was rapidly becoming apparent that the formation of the land would need to be fundamentally altered in order to accommodate the planned infrastructure. To this end, large-scale terraforming of the Coronado Bay area would persist through 1993 wherein several teams would work to level the ground and pour the excess earth into the harbor as fill, changing the look of the coastline in the process. Then, the new harbor was dredged so that the city could accommodate larger shipping ports, and a station for the Planetran Intercontinental Maglev was also planned, allowing for easier transportation by sea. In 1994, construction proper had officially begun for Coronado City, most of it carried out by the Aldecaldo Nomad family, a tribe originally hailing from from Los Angeles that had escaped the city two years prior due to growing rates of violence, as was the case in just about all of America's major cities at the time. The Aldecaldos had quickly made a name for themselves as professional freelance laborers, already having claimed some level of renown for rebuilding an area of Pittsburgh after a nuclear meltdown the year prior. But the Aldecaldos certainly weren't the only party interested in the work. Aside from the five corporations on the Coronado Partnership, the city was also being funded by various construction organizations with ties to the Mafia, the Yakuza, and others. Ties that were likely unbeknownst to Knight himself. The idea was that by supplying generous sums of money in service of Knight's vision, these gangs would be able to secure an early foothold in the city, and may even be able to make a return on investment in the form of lucrative construction contracts. However, what the mob didn't anticipate was Richard Knight's steadfast commitment to his own advanced construction techniques, those same techniques that he had first developed with Halsey and Ferris years prior, which all but eliminated the possibility for many of the established firms to acquire substantial work whatsoever. But what was more, Knight remained a man of principle as well, and stayed as steadfastly opposed to any mention of crime or extrajudicial dealings as ever before. One of the organizations that Knight crossed with this zealous decry of criminal influence was in fact, the very same company he'd left to start Knight International. After his departure, Halsey and Ferris of Halsey, Ferris, and Knight had brought California mob boss Bruce Skiv into the fold as a co-owner, thus renaming the company Halsey, Ferris, and Skiv. And as expected, they too were displeased. So it was that Knight became a wanted man to the criminal underworld of Southern California. The cost of being tough on crime was already beginning to mount for him, and unfortunately, his dues would only continue to rise. It's said that for the first four years of Coronado City's development, Development, Richard Knight received threats of violence nearly every day. Many of these were simply ignored by him, but as simple threats soon escalated and intimidation and sabotage instead became the norm, Knight's corporate backers were called upon to combat the issue. It's thought that Arasaka in particular may have played a significant role in rooting out Knight's criminal dissenters, but even their ruthless security division was no match for the guerrilla tactics of the mob at this point. And if anything, the presence of security only served to enrage them. Knight's time was of the essence. Coronado City would have been largely complete by 1998, having successfully persevered in spite of the collapse and the social unrest in America. However, where the city still faltered was in its crime-free vision. On the contrary, in fact, the corruption of officials and Knight's business partners ran deep, and none in the city would have been more aware of this fact than the founder himself. For late in the year, the enemies that Richard Knight had made with his ideals at last caught up with him. Quote, Finally, Knight's luck ran out. On September 20th, 1998, he was shot and killed in his penthouse suite at the top of the newly constructed Parkview Tower. Knight's killer was never apprehended, 
In his memory, the newly appointed city council officially renamed Coronado City as Knight City. Then, the scramble for power began. Knight's leadership was the only effective blockade that his city had against complete turmoil, and with him gone, the mob poured into the area in droves. And in truth, this easily could have been the extent of Knight's legacy, an expensive and visionary project now abandoned to the very forces which it sought to combat. But luckily, there was still someone to organize the capital and resources Knight had left behind, and put them back to work in service of his vision, even in his absence. Years before the start of the Coronado City project, Knight had met and married a woman named Miriam, who empathized, as Knight did, with the struggle of the common man, and with the endeavors of the city project. Now left a widow, Miriam reorganized her late husband's business, Knight International, and formed Knight's Foundation in 1999, in hopes of pushing ever closer to Knight's idyllic dream, no matter how lofty it may be. To this end, Knight's Foundation was instrumental in matters of city planning and infrastructure, and would remain so for many years, with Miriam herself taking the position of CEO. It seems, though, that in spite of all of their work, and genuine passion for assisting the people of Knight's city, any of the good that may have come out of Knight's foundation would have been eclipsed hundredfold by the negative impacts generated by the criminal forces that now ran the city. Six years later, by 2005, crime once again reigned supreme in the Del Coronado Bay area, amplified to a point where it was likely worse than before Knight's arrival in the first place. Even though Knight's corporate partners were still present in the area, few, if any, were truly interested in running Knight City in the wake of his death, at least at this point, preferring instead to maintain their presence from the corporate plaza and in other neighboring compounds. As it happens, though, this indifference by the corpse was actually something that hadn't really been anticipated by the criminal usurpers. The city council, composed largely of mobsters, found it increasingly difficult to maintain the city in the years that followed without the help and funding of the corporations that Night City was fundamentally reliant on. But nevertheless, they would manage, though only for around four years. By 2009, all manner of crime had turned the city into a battlefield, with no refuge whatsoever. It's said that between 2005 and 2009, the number of homicides in Night City eclipsed what other major cities in the U.S. projected in a decade's time, with unsolved cases looming into the thousands. In addition, some of the first major boot booster gangs, such as the Blood Razors and the Slaughterhouse, had also begun to appear, adding to the mayhem all the more as combat implants became more common. But, as they say, night is always darkest just before the dawn, and so too was Night City in its darkest hour when the corporations began at last to pay attention again. Put plainly, 2009 was the year when mob activity crescendoed. Hereafter, its ramifications were dubbed by the corpse to be bad for business, and thus, being given a reason to finally retake the city, this would mark the start of the mob war. For two years, corporate and criminal forces battled outright in the city streets, and from the outset, the war was very one-sided. Arasaka's highly trained paramilitary personnel stood at the forefront, backed by a cavalry of war machines, with tanks and aerodyne included. Bombings, assassinations, and raids were commonplace, and had a devastating effect on the mob. This was the might of the Arasaka Corporation on full display, and by 2011, the struggle for power between the corporate and criminal had a decisive victor. Placing a puppet mayor in command of the city, and electing a council composed mainly of security officers, the mob was run out of Night City's various neighborhoods in droves, though many pockets still remained, many of whom would form the foundations for more modern booster gangs, some of which still persist even by the year 2077. However, corporate control came with some less favorable caveats as well, such as renewed corporate interest in the city resulting in a huge drop in affordable housing as the corpse refurbished and renovated thousands of residential complexes following the mob war. Many who could not afford the changes were evicted, and private military lodging often took their place. However, as the city's need for constant protection from the mob weaned, so too did the housing dilemma, until things were more or less back to normal a few years later. Still, the whole ordeal 
ordeal set a dangerous precedent for just how far the corpse could extend their influence into the day-to-day -day life of Night City citizens. In 2012, Night City was recognized as part of the Free State of Northern California, a status that helped them to govern themselves autonomously and evade some of the social and political fallout of the turbulent new United States, which was in its early years at this point. Though this effectively walled off Night City from a lot of federal control, travel was still permitted to and from the NUSA via a checkpoint in Southern California, and which we can visit should we pick the nomad life path in Cyberpunk 2077. By the time of the 2020s, the Night City we've come to know was coming into fruition. Although the people and the megacorps had a somewhat dicey relationship, it was still considered a far preferable alternative to mob rule, still fresh in the minds of many. The city was exceedingly dangerous, more dangerous than most, but it was also a place of great economic growth, and most importantly, there was a hope, however small, for success and stability, which was more than a lot of the rest of the nation could say for itself at the time, so there's that. There were, of course, a handful of dramatic events to shake the city in the previous eight years, most notably Johnny Silverhand's infamous riot and raid of Arasaka Tower in 2013, but it wouldn't be until the start of the fourth corporate war that we'd see too many sweeping changes to Night City's landscape and its populace. Now, the fourth corporate is a conflict that we've covered multitudinous times on this channel, a vicious bout between rival oceanographic tech corporations Sino and Otec, fought by proxy of the world's two largest private defense firms, Arasaka and Militech respectively. The war raged worldwide for four years, between 2021 and 2025, and being a free city, which hosted the corporate offices of both companies, Arasaka and Militech, Night City was hit extremely hard, culminating in an event known as the Night City Holocaust, or AHQ Disaster. While the events of this single night are more than enough to constitute their own video, which I put in the top right, you might want to check it out, the thing that's most important to the direct ramifications on Night City is the aftermath of what occurred. You see, the AHQ disaster is called as such because on this day, August 20th, 2023, the Arasaka Tower was decimated by a nuclear blast from a small armament mounted in the building by a Militech-sponsored strike team, consisting of several legendary figures, including Morgan Blackhand, Johnny Silverhand, and Spider Murphy, to name a few. In the wake of the explosion, much of the corporate center was left as a crater, resulting in a nuclear hotbed that would persist in some form until at least 2045. It's here that we once again see Knight's Foundation, now re organized as Night Corp step in for the betterment of the city, as could be expected in times of tragedy such as this. Night Corp offered free cyberware, biomonitors, and exceptional pay to anyone willing to sift through the radioactive hot zone and assist in the cleanup. Despite these compensations and precautions, though, it is known that some nebulous number of people perished in the restoration effort. The exact numbers are unknown, however, as they were purposefully withheld by both Night Corp and city government. But what is known is that many of the deceased belonged to the Aldecaldo family, the same group that had helped construct the city nearly 30 years prior. Unfortunately, since nomads are largely considered outsiders in Night City even to this day, this cover-up did not exactly attract the attention of a lot of people. To be fair though, the average citizen also had a lot of bigger problems during the time of the Fourth Corporate War than the whereabouts of a few dead Aldecaldos, with perhaps one of the most pressing of those problems being the obfuscation of the net in the event known as the Data Crash. At the time of death of infamous hacker and netrunner Raish Bartmas at the hands of an Arasaka strike team, or an orbital strike, sources differ on which, a dead man's switch was activated that would eventually unleash an array of hostile programs designed and embedded into the very fabric of net reality years earlier by Bartmas himself. This would result in over 75% of net information being rendered completely lost, or worse, corrupted into hostile bundles of artificially intelligent code. Because of this, the net was no longer safe to access in the same way, and so as the 2030s rolled around, many densely populated areas began to experiment with localized networks, walled off from the main net 
through intense arrays of security protocol and highly advanced firmware. During this time, Knight Corp worked closely with the Ziggurat Corporation to completely overhaul the city's data term networks into a new system, one of the world's first city nets, therefore restoring access to net infrastructure to millions of Night City residents. The solution was by no means perfect, but it has held with only slight alteration and routine maintenance to this day, largely thanks to safeguarding from Netwatch. But there is a big problem that we have yet to address, and that is that despite their work during and in the years to follow the AHQ disaster, Night Corp hasn't really accomplished all that much. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, neither of the corporations which resulted from restructuring following Knight's death have really been going above and beyond in the Knight City community as was suggested that they should be. So what's going on? Aside from buying out the company Encart in 2068 following their bankruptcy due to bad press from an attack that occurred in one of their subway stations, Knight Corp's current projects and inner workings have remained largely a mystery. Of course, today Knight Corp still works to fund industrial projects and conserve institutions of public good, as well as partially funding MaxTAC and the NCPD, as is referenced in Cyberpunk 2077's database entry referring to the company, but having lost the competitive battle for the top brass of Night City to Arasaka and Militech, as proven by the fourth corporate, it's entirely unknown how and from where they derive capital. This is all in spite of the company being voted the fifth best corporation to work for by 2077, owing to a decision to reduce the number of mandatory hours in a work week down to a generous 80. In other words, if we assume that an employee at Night Corporation works seven days a week, they'll be expected, at minimum, to work for for just under 12 hours a day. And it's here that we come to the darker side of the Knight family legacy. With Richard himself dead and Miriam having long since stepped down from the position of CEO, Knight Corporation has adopted a more sinister association. While their devotion to the betterment of Knight City seems genuine enough, what's more questionable is their devotion to the value of the individual, since throughout Cyberpunk 2077, V uncovers a mountain of evidence pointing to a disturbing realization. Those who have played Cyberpunk 2077 may remember Sandra Dorset, aka the woman in the ice bath who we rescue alongside Jackie at the beginning of the game. In this segment, Dorset has been captured by scavengers, and the signal from her biomonitor was suppressed so that Trauma Team was unaware of her location and status. After rescuing her though, and handing her over to Trauma, the mission ends, and we may not be expecting to hear from her really ever again. But as it turns out, Sandra will require your help later on in the side job Full Disclosure. Here, V is hired to retrieve a data bank lost by Dorset in the past, and when it's retrieved, we have the opportunity to crack it. If we do, we can begin to piece together a small narrative using the data we recover, as well as some contextual information from data shards found throughout Dorset's apartment. And as it turns out, what we learn is that Sandra Dorset is not only an employee of the elusive Knight Corporation, but an excellent netrunner to boot. Through a combination of these traits, she was able to steal data only intended to be seen internally at the company, regarding a secret project called Operation Carpe Noctum, a Latin phrase which translates to seize the night. According to the databank, what Carpe Noctum hopes to achieve is essentially the creation of an AI that's being tested internally at Night Corp as a tool for conditioning their own employees, and according to Sandra, pretty much anyone else that Night Corp feels inclined to have a authority over. Use an AGI to condition workers' minds. Mm, that's some supervillain shit right there. Eventually, it'll let them control anyone they want. That's what scares me the most. Glad to see there are runners who are finding old school dirt like this. I just hope it gets put to good use. Oh, it will. Don't you worry about that. Many have even speculated that we may actually see the Knight Corporation utilizing this AI elsewhere in the game, as a matter of fact, since the description of its function seems very similar to the covert conditioning of mayoral candidate Jefferson Perales and his wife Elizabeth in the Dream On quest. This assertion is made all the more convincing when we consider that the Perales's also have connections to Knight Corporation spanning all the way back to their college years, since the company awarded Jeff nearly $3 million 
million euro dollars with which to study law. If this very convincing theory is to be believed, this would mean that the Perales's personal security, Secure Services Incorporated, the ones behind the brainwashing, must necessarily have a connection to the Knight Corporation. And perhaps more disturbingly, so too does Mr. Blue Eyes, the infamous G-Man-esque cryptid of the cyberpunk storyline. Now, I'm not prepared to speak all too thoroughly on how all of these different pieces may fit together, I think that's out of the scope of this video, but what I do know is that a company founded on the principle of steadfast commitment to the betterment of Night City may have more than a passive interest in directly puppeteering a popular mayoral candidate. And the fact that Mr. Perales borrows many leadership characteristics from the late Richard Knight, being at least, from our perspective, an honest man with a legitimate interest in matters of morality, also serves to make this connection all the more compelling. And, in a sense, that kind of brings me back around to one of the conclusions I hinted at earlier in this video. The story of Richard Knight and of his legacy, whether it be in Knight International, Knight's Foundation, or even Knight Corporation, is ultimately the story of the constant attrition tested between the moral and the morally bankrupt. We've long established by now that Richard Knight's commitment to an idyllic cityscape was so concrete, so unwavering, and so woefully indifferent to compromise or concession that it was, dare I say it, always doomed to fail. From start to finish, the story of Knight and of the multitude of organizations that came to follow has been an unending uphill battle, interrupted at every conceivable point by forces of corruption and dishonesty. Well, I certainly think that in the context of real life, there is a sort of Sisyphean merit to the philosophy of continuing to work towards a goal regardless of its complete attainability, what I see in Cyberpunk's interpretation of events is a much darker premise, one where, in the case of Night Corp, the promise of a utopic future has been carried by so many and for so long that it is slowly beginning to erode, even by those who are meant to embody it most devoutly. What I mean by this is that while on the one hand I can't reasonably see the Knight Corporation having completely abandoned its roots as a company for the betterment of the public, I also can't reasonably see how a project like Carpe Noctum fits into Knight's vision of a safe, honest and crime-free city without reducing that to its most literal and inhuman definition. While there may indeed be empirical, data-driven merit to this approach, is the cost of the individual and the precedent set by such a program truly worth it? Some will say yes, but I would wager that most people would probably say no and it seems that Knight Corporation may feel similarly, given their want to conceal the true purpose of Carpe Noctum from the public eye. All in all, I think that one of the most interesting and ominous reads on Knight Corp comes from its Cyberpunk 2077 database entry, the final lines of which read as follows, quote, It seems there are still those in the company's rather mysterious structure who have not lost faith in the vision of the city's founder, even if cheapened by corporate slogans and guided primarily by political political interests, the merits of Knight Corp's role in the free city's history cannot be diminished. In fact, with this in mind, some residents have expressed they wish for the day Knight Corp returns to a position of true power. Be careful what you wish for, Knight City. With the things we've seen out there today, this may just come true. That being said though, that's pretty much all I've got for you today. Thanks for sticking around here until the end, and I hope that you enjoyed hearing a bit about the lore of the prolific Richard Knight and his legacy in modern day Night City. This was a really fun bit of cyberpunk lore to talk about, and of course, I hope that you found yourself to have a little bit better understanding of the cyberpunk storyline after having watched. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, then there's two different things you can do. The first is, of course, to subscribe so that you can be notified when I upload new lore videos in the future. I really appreciate it, and it does help to grow the channel a decent amount, but the other thing you can do is check out my cyberpunk video playlist linked in the top right corner, and get yourself caught up with some of the lore that I already put out. The AHQ disaster video that I mentioned earlier should be in there, as is one that's nearly an hour long about the full history of Arasaka, if that sounds like something you'd be interested in seeing, and even my very first cyberpunk lore video, which was about the data crash and Raish Bartmoss, if all of that sounded appealing to you. If you decide to check it out, then thanks a lot, 
lot, I hope that you have a good time with it, and per the usual, if you have anything to say about this video, whether it be a thought, theory, or something you would have liked to see me add, then feel free to let me know in the comments. I really do try and read the vast majority of comments that I get, and you have a pretty good chance of getting one of those little heart stamps from me, especially if you comment early into this video being posted. Those tend to be the ones that I read more so, so uh, yeah. I look forward to seeing what you guys have to say down there. Anyway, that's gonna pretty much do it from me. This is Averberon, I'll see you again soon, and have a good one.